Hello everyone and welcome to SUNUP. I'm Lyndall Stout. A string of warmer days means soil temperatures are heating up and weeds are taking off. To help tackle them in your field, we turn to our extension weed scientist, Angela Post. So right now we're really seeing a lot of weeds come up because we've had some rain and we're starting to see warm temperatures. Here in Stillwater or central Oklahoma, we're seeing um, the pigweeds emerge, palmer amaranth, water hemp, uh, and some tumble pigweeds. We're also seeing common lambs quarters and many of our summer annual grasses are beginning to emerge as well. In terms of what's emerging, it kind of depends on how warm it's been and where you are in the state, right? Yes, exactly, and different parts of the state actually have different um, suites of weeds. So particularly up in the panhandle, you would be seeing things more like a lot of kochia and also Russian thistle coming up. Everywhere in the state, we're seeing uh, mare's tail coming up right now. And those are all of the annual weeds that we're seeing at this time of year begin to emerge. And then in terms of no-till versus conventional till, explain the differences in the weeds we might see. So you're still going to be battling some of the same weeds, but particularly in no-till systems, it's going to be more difficult um, when you have perennial weeds in those systems. So the perennial weeds that we might see right now emerging uh, for the summer would be field bindweed and also um, our Johnson grass, which would be a big problem for people who are going to be going to uh, grain sorghum or corn. We're out here on a cloudy, kind of moist day. We haven't had a lot of moisture in the last few years, but we've gotten more recently. Is that impacting the, the weeds you're seeing at all? So uh, we are seeing a lot of emergence right now. I haven't seen huge differences between um, this year and previous years because we did have some, some spring rain last year that uh, caused emergence. Um, but it's yet to be seen as we, we move through the season, if we get additional moisture, if that's gonna change uh, what and how many weeds we see. We want to talk about treatment options, but first let's kind of identify, we have a few in this field, what are we seeing right here? So right here we're seeing a common lambs quarter, which is a little bit bigger in the field now. So you'll be looking on this weed for kind of a mealy white cast at the top of those leaves, and if you touch it with your fingers you can rub it off. And that's very common for this species. We're also seeing a lot of pigweeds, so we have them of various sizes here. Um, those kind of are characteristically have this reddish tinge to them when they first come up. That will go away as they get larger. Um, it's also important to think about these at, at this time because they're less than an inch tall, but for pigweeds, we really want to target them um, at the under four inches, and it's gonna be only uh, maybe 10 days or so before they reach that size. So in terms of treatment options, what should producers think about? So for treating these weeds and getting rid of them ahead of planting, you really want to start clean. Uh, for those of, of us that are in conventional till, then tillage is going to be one of your main tools that you use. Um, a field like this one that we've been looking at uh, would get an additional tillage event and then possibly a pre-residual herbicide. And those pre-residuals are going to be very important for um, almost every crop that we're talking about planting for summer. Um, in no-till, we're definitely going to be looking more at a pre-plant burndown application with the addition of a pre-residual. And that residual herbicide will give you pre-emergence activity up to the time of your crop emergence. We won't talk about real specific herbicides at this point because it's going to vary depending on what crop you're growing. Okay, Angela Post, our Extension Weed Scientist, thank you very much. And for more information on treating weeds, just go to our website, sunup.okstate.edu. Hi, I'm Al Sutherland with your Mesonet Weather Report. It wasn't just storms going up and down this last week. Saturday morning, April 4th, temperatures dropped below freezing across northern and western stretches of Oklahoma. The freezing temperatures occurred as far south as Altus, where it got down to 31 degrees. The coldest locations were Buffalo and Medford at 23 degrees. Alva, Medford, and Breckenridge went below freezing for eight hours. Two days later on Monday, April 6th, the heat rolled in. Alva warmed to 96 degrees, 
Hollis hit 95. On Monday, 20 locations reached 90 degrees or higher. The coolest location on Monday was Cookson in eastern Oklahoma with a high of 72 degrees. Tuesday saw more heat. 25 mesonet sites hit 90 degrees or higher. The coolest afternoon high was 79 degrees at Kenton, Durant, Lane, Antlers, and Clayton. Another way to monitor heat is by the potential water loss from soil and plants. Tuesday, April 7th, areas north and west of I-44 had over a quarter inch of water demand. East and south of I-44, water demand was under a quarter inch. A quarter inch of water demand is a lot for an April day. Here's Gary with a look at our current drought conditions. Thanks, Alan. Good morning, everyone. Well, we've had a few bouts with severe weather. It's not very fun, but that's how we get our rainfall during the spring. We've gotten some pretty good precip across parts of the state, but boy, do we need a lot more across the western half of the state. Let's take a look at that latest U.S. Drought Monitor map. Well, this map was released Thursday morning and it shows the same old, very old pattern that we have seen all year, even back to fall really, with drought intensifying in the west and the north, with some relief across the east, even up into parts of central Oklahoma. And we can see that pretty clearly on the drought monitor change map since the beginning of the year. So since the beginning of the calendar year, we have west central and northeastern Oklahoma intensifying by, in some cases, two to three categories. So that's possibly um, moderate to severe drought all the way up to uh, severe to exceptional drought. Um, so lots of changes and we can see some relief down there in southeastern Oklahoma. Now the Mesonet rainfall map since the beginning of the year show this pretty clearly. Uh, the rainfall total maps less than two inches across the northwestern quarter and it increases from there to the southeast from 10 to 17 inches down across far southeastern Oklahoma. Um, so lots of rain from the beginning of the year uh, in the southeastern parts of the state. You get uh, northwest of I-44 and, and the, the totals drop off pretty dramatically. So we do need that rainfall regardless of what weather comes with it. It's, it's unfortunate times, but we do need that moisture. That's it for this time. We'll see you next time on the Mesonet Weather Report. Joining us now is Charles Looper, who is part of our pesticide safety team for Extension. And Charles, you and the team have your annual event coming up. Tell us a little bit about what it is and who can get involved. Okay, on April 22nd, we have the Unwanted Pesticide Disposal Program, uh, which is run through the Department of Agriculture that we help promote. Uh, that is a program free to the public to get rid of any unwanted or unusable pesticides in the state of Oklahoma. Now define for me, if you will, what a pesticide is, because there's really more under that umbrella than I even realized. Yeah, a pesticide essentially encompasses any kind of uh, product that will control any type of pests, which includes uh, weed killers, insect killers, uh, fungicides or, or uh, disease products, all the way down to uh, rodenticides, the rat killers, poisons. Uh, and then a, a ton of other things uh, out there that, that it registers with the Department of Ag and has an EPA number will be qualified for the event. So if I have things around the farm that I've been wanting to get rid of for a long time, now's the chance. This is definitely take advantage uh, of this April 22nd date. Uh, this will be the, the opportunity in 2015. Uh, it's, it's very simple. They just have to bring it to the site, drop it off. Uh, really there's no paperwork or questions asked. Uh, if individuals get that there, it'll be properly disposed of and uh, about as simple as you can get. Okay, so really all you do is load it up and bring it in and you guys will take care of it, dispose of it properly. Correct, the Department of Agriculture contracts with a hazardous waste contractor that will collect the materials properly, transport that. Uh, majority of it will be properly disposed of and essentially an incinerator, uh, all EPA, uh, credentialed, uh, approved, proper process of getting rid of that, keeps it out of the streams, uh, the ditches, that kind of thing um, on that and stuff. So definitely an easy way to get rid of that and, and definitely a very easy process. Now you mentioned no paperwork, so you know there's really, you don't have to do anything. It's pretty easy. What about a weight limit? Uh, there is a 2,500 pound weight limit uh, for each entity. 
uh, out there. So that is so nobody overwhelms the system. We try to have as many individuals take advantage of the, of the program as possible on that. Okay, well, good luck with all of that. And for more information, you can always touch base with your local county extension office or check out the link on our website, sunup.okstate.edu. As we wrap up this spring's calving season, there's bound to be uh, that question coming from either one of the uh, newspapers, magazines, or even a producer about what the incidence of multiple births are in beef cattle. You see, some producer has found that he had triplets, or in some very rare cases, even quadruplets, and would like to know how often those things occur. Well, there's not a lot of scientific literature that helps answer those questions, but there are a few situations that as we look back through the literature that gives us at least some idea of what to expect. In the case of twinning, we think that the incidence of, in beef cattle is someplace between a half and one percent of births ending up as twins. When we get to triplets, it's one in about 100,000. And if you have that very rare situation of quadruplets that live, it's only one in 700,000, uh, according to the literature estimates. So those things are pretty rare. I think the key things that we want to remember if we have a multiple birth on, on our operation is that if we have a heifer, born twin or triplets to bulls, that heifer has a 95% or higher chance of being infertile. She's what we call a free martin. We want to mark down in our record books right now when we see that heifer calf born twin to a bull and remember not to keep her as a replacement heifer. We want to go ahead and cull her and send her on to the feedlot to be fed out as, as choice beef. That's also, I think, a good reason to remember that if you're raising replacement heifers this year and, and breeding them, let's go ahead and have those heifers pregnancy checked as soon as your local veterinarian is willing to do that and cull any heifers that didn't get bred in that first breeding season because a few of those might be that free martin that slipped through the cracks in terms of our record keeping or if we purchased the heifers we had no chance of knowing that uh, one or more of those might have been born twin to a bull. So let's remember that any heifer born twin or as triplets to bull calves is going to be one that we want to cull send on to the feedlot and not keep as a replacement. Hey, we look forward to visiting with you again next week on Sunup's Cow-Calf Corner. With calving season in full swing, we want to talk about management tips for producers with our beef value enhancement specialist, Gant Mauer. And Gant, what kind of things maybe producers should be thinking about this time of year? Well, uh, like, like you said, those calves are hitting the ground and, and typically the first time we, we handle those calves is, is two months of age um, or what some people refer to as branding um, in a traditional sense. Um, so there's some tools that we can utilize to, to add value to those animals right now, even as young as they are. Um, the, the first one be, would be uh, to use an implant uh, to implant that calf, and we can increase efficiency of growth of that calf anywhere from, from five to about 7%. Um, uh, and, and the value of gain uh, would, would be anywhere from 85 to a to dollar at this point in time. Uh, and, and it's it's a very cost-effective tool, costs about $2, um, and, and we increase efficiency and capitalize on that gain. Now, if, if you're marketing natural or organic beef, of course, you're not going to want uh, to use an implant, but only about 6% of all beef marketed in the United States is natural or organic, so, so we need to be using those implants. 
uh, talk about the VAC 45 program. When's a good time mm -hmm. to start that? Absolutely. So, so again, we're going to have those those animals up, those calves up. Um, we need to get them vaccinated for that marketing program uh, later on this fall, um, and we'll do that with a, a respiratory vaccine, um, uh, with a black leg vaccine, and, and possibly with with a pastorilla vaccine as well. Um, you may want to get with your veterinarian um, to, to determine if we're going to use a, a killed product or a modified live product, and really. Uh, how you've handled your cows, not your calves, will, will determine on which of those, those products you actually use. And then a couple of other things to talk about, of course, we want to remind folks about wormers and castration. Yep, um, a, a huge one, and, and we've actually seen a decline in the amount of, of um, steer calves as compared to bull calves going through livestock markets in recent years. Um, and, and as long as we castrate those, those bull calves early, um, uh, it, it's really less stress on those animals. Um, and, and if you think about it, it's also a welfare issue. If we let those calves get up to, to six, seven, eight hundred pounds, it's very stressful on those animals. Um, they, they go off feed for a long period of time, and in fact, we lose, lose more money. So if we castrate and use an implant, uh, we'll, we'll capture all that weight back on those calves very easily and very cost effectively. You know, and the other thing we may think about is, is a good worming um, protocol. Um, and, and really, Justin Talley, our, our livestock entomologist, will, will tell us that we need to mix those wormers up. We really need to, need to keep those bugs guessing, and that's the most um, efficacious way uh, uh, to get those, those worms and those bugs out of, out of those animals. And really, it adds a lot of value in terms of performance, both to calves and cows. Now the Oklahoma Quality Beef Network, we talk about that from time to time, but really it can impact the bottom line if you kind of follow those guidelines. Yep, absolutely, Lyndall. So, so again, we're preparing those calves to be marketed this fall, and, and what we've seen is, is an 8 to 10 percent increase in value over a non-weaned calf for these OQB and VAC 45 calves. And, and that's a pretty consistent number over the last six or seven years. So it's, it's hard to predict what prices are going to do this fall, but, but that's, a, that's a number that, that we're pretty confident with. Now you and the team at Animal Science are also preparing to welcome a special guest, Kurt Pate. A lot of people recognize that name. Yep, absolutely. So as we're bringing these, these cows and calves in, uh, we, we wanted to put a seminar on on, on how we're going to handle those. It's going to be at the, uh, the Tadashek Animal Science Arena here in Stillwater. Um, and what he's actually going to be doing is gonna, he's going to be handling cattle on horseback starting at 4 p.m. Um, and and he'll, he'll answer questions and, and, and do his seminar and demonstration until about 5.30, where we'll, we'll break for a short dinner, um, and then we'll go back uh, inside the, the arena, and he will handle cattle in a, in a small but yet very functional working facility on foot, um, and have some pen design and some other aspects that producers can take home with them. Um, all that we do is, is ask that you RSVP for a meal and let us know you're coming, so, uh, so if you do want dinner, we can provide that for you. Okay, Gant, yeah, thanks a lot. And for more information on how to RSVP for that event, just go to our website and click on the links section. Hi, welcome to Shop Stop. Today we want to talk a little bit about exposed belts, maybe chains, and shielding options. Okay, there are certain criteria that are out there that you can look up on what is required for shielding on, on moving components. And, and this, uh, this unit right here, this buffer, is an exposed belt. And so it's easy, it would be easy for, you know, to, to get uh, uh, fingers into pinch points on the pulleys and in the belt. And so the idea would be to shield the entire thing so that you can't get a uh, so you can't get your hands in there at all. Now you can, like this shield is, is completely cover up all the components where there's no, you can't see anything. Or you can have, you may have some units that are say a compressor that have to have air blowing across the cylinders and they've got, the pulley actually is a fan. This will need to be expanded metal. 
but that expanded metal can't be large enough that you can stick your finger through. Yeah. So that's the big issue is can you get a finger or a hand inside where the moving parts are? And then the other thing that, that you have to think about is, you know, what are you shielding? Is it just a V-belt or is it a chain drive system? So when you've got moving components, make sure you've got them shielded to keep yourself protected. And we'll see you next time on Shop Stop. Time now to catch up with our crop marketing specialist, Kim Anderson. And Kim, you got two important things going on in the market as well as the price outlook this week. Yeah, I think the most important thing going on right now is the weather, and then second is the WASDE report that was uh, released last Thursday. Well, let's start with the weather. Of course, it's always on everybody's mind. Well, I was watching that KC uh, July contract uh, last week. Uh, it was down about 20 cents, and then it popped down about another row, 14, 15, 16 cents. Uh, you get to looking at what's going on. I think it's completely related to the weather forecast uh, for rain this weekend and early next week. Okay, and overall the wheat's in pretty good shape, especially compared to last year? Well, I, we get that in the reports, but in talking to some producers, and like in the southwest, Altus, it's better than it's been in years, but I think up, you get up around Enid and north central Oklahoma, the main wheat area, I think some of that wheat has been hurt, and I don't know if it's going to recover with this weather. I don't think that's in the market yet. Okay. Let's talk about the supply and demand numbers. Those have just been released. Well, there was a whole lot of nothing in that report. You look at those numbers uh, on that WASDE for wheat. Uh, it came out at 684 million bushels ending stock. 692 was the uh, trade estimate. Uh, in March, it was 691. A lot of nothing. Corn, uh, 1.83 billion bushels uh, ending stocks. Uh, 185 was the trade estimate, uh, 1.78 uh, in March. So I think corn, there is some negative news there. World on wheat, 7.25 billion was the number estimate pre-release, 7.26, 7.26 last month, a whole lot of nothing. With corn though, just like in the U.S., uh, 7.42 billion bushels compared to 7.36 expected and 7.29 last month. So corn, I think there's some, some news there. Wheat, uh, no market reaction, and that's just about what you'd expect. And then finally, the price outlook, how's that impacting everything? Well, you look at prices, they've been going down with this uh, weather uh, market right now. I think the weather's going to determine things. You got to look back over the last few months. <laughs> How accurate has the weather forecast been? You know, we've been 50%, 100% chances of rain, and we got a couple hundredths of an inch, especially in the wheat area. So if we get the rain, the prices are going to go down. If the wheat's hurt more than I think it is, then I think prices will come back up and be higher as we get into harvest. Okay, Kim Anderson, Crop Marketing Specialist. We'll see you next week. Finally today, we want to revisit a favorite story from last year that shows the important role landowners and researchers have played in shaping the mesonet system over the past two decades. Here's SUNUP's Dave Deacon. Every day, or every month at least, is really a new story in the mesonet. And whether it's a historic ice storm or a historic heat wave. It is a, a great outdoor laboratory. Now, a lot of times we may not uh, like some of the things that Mother Nature throws at us. But the Oklahoma Mesonet has been there to record all of those events. The Mesonet is celebrating 20 years of operation. That's 20 years of over a thousand atmospheric and subterranean observations sent back to the Norman office every five minutes from the 120 sites across Oklahoma. When we started, we started from zero. The concept was to build the network from scratch so there's consistency, so we don't have to worry about uh, one set of sensors at one place and another set at another, so you don't have to worry if one's a little bit different than another. We've actually evolved now with 20 years of data into the beginnings of a climate network, not just a weather network. Our archive now exceeds 5 billion observations, and there's really nowhere else in the world with such a dense archive of weather data. You can pick a, a day in our 20-year our mesonet history, pick a site, Go back to that hour and tell somebody this is what, what we recorded at that time. You might call the Oklahoma Mesonet a success story because of all the data that it has collected over the past 20 years. But none of that would have been possible if not for the successful partnership 
between Oklahoma's two largest research universities. OU and OSU joined forces to develop the plan for the state's mesonet. We found out that we had uh, some colleagues at the University of Oklahoma in the Norman Weather community that also had ideas about a, a better and bigger network of weather stations in the state. And in 1991, Governor Henry Bellman gave us our initial funding to put out our first 108 weather stations. J.D. Carlson did Eastern Oklahoma and I did Western Oklahoma. And when we started out, we thought we were gonna have trouble locating places to put all of these sites. We primarily worked with OSU and the county educators across the state to look for good representative sites in each county. There are people actually competing to get one of these sites on their land. We thought that they wouldn't want to give up a corner of their pasture and put this big 30-foot tower in there, but they were actually eager for it. We had those deployed by January 1st, 1994, and our network was operational. To be truly a statewide network, we felt that we had to uh, be dispersed across the state and get a, uh, a good on the ground look at our weather as, as it happens. And we know we live in a, a state with very dynamic weather. Just a fantastic data source that lets us do some things that, that uh, our, our colleagues in other places are quite envious about. And the best part is it's accessible to everyone the world over with special focus on helping Oklahomans. I think we had a, a part in helping connect rural Oklahoma into a lot of these, especially weather information, but in some ways, once they had the connection to weather information, it opened up a whole lot of other uh, kinds of opportunities, especially with some of the rural schools. We work with firefighters, fire managers, emergency managers, farmers, growers and producers in the K through 12 community across the state to use the data to make decisions for their local communities. We're a very weather conscious state, so whether it comes to public safety or uh, business and economic value, educational value research, we, we uh, see our data applied in just a wide variety of settings. So it's kind of a one-stop shopping for Oklahoma weather. A reminder for producers about upcoming canola field tours beginning April 14th at stops across Oklahoma. For more information, you can visit our website or you can always contact your local county extension office. The SUNUP team is looking forward to those canola field tours and we plan to make the stop in Kingfisher. We hope to see you there. And that'll do it for the show this week. A reminder, you can find us anytime on our website at sunup.okstate.edu and also follow us on YouTube and social media. I'm Lyndall Stout. We'll see you next time at SUNUP.